All right, hearing none, now moving us along. Okay, so as you can see by the slide, there are a lot of numbers and the next few slides are also gonna have a lot of numbers. So please, um, if anyone wants me to like stop or go back to another slide, just shout it out and we can do that. Um, we have been working with KPMG who is a consulting firm and they have been um, the team that we are working with is in year three of the waiver in New York. So they've been great to have on board because they have some lessons learned from being a few years ahead in this work, although the New York waiver is very different. Um, but we've been really grateful to have their thinking as part of our team. They went ahead and did some funds flow modeling of how our um, project selection would impact the amount of money we can earn as a region. So in, a, in the very simple way it works is each region has a pool of money. That pool of money is allocated towards the different project areas. If you select all eight projects, you have the potential to earn 100% of the money allocated towards your region in all those project areas. If you choose to take off some projects, so let's say we choose six projects instead of eight, we actually don't earn all of the money. We for, initially in year one, we forego the money that would have been in those project bu buckets, but later down the line, once we start earning and pay for our performance, we have the opportunity um, that some of that money will get rebased into other project areas so that we can earn it. We can earn a little more cash in other areas uh, to make up for what we passed on. I'm going to pause in case there's any questions. All right, I'm going to keep going. So what we have here is on the left, this is an estimate of what eight projects would look like. Um, now, my caveats are, these numbers are based off of 2015 Medicaid lives. So once in 2017, when they do the recalculation of what our Medicaid lives look like, all of these numbers, numbers will shift slightly. Um, so this is not exact. And again, we don't have full clarity on the reduction in funding. So this slide is looking at a estimated 30% reduction in funding, kind of playing it safe between 27 and 36%. Um, um, and it's just cut straight across the board. So this is our best, oops, sorry, our best estimation. As you can see here on eight projects, if we select all eight and we do, this is, this is looking at us doing 100%, we score on all of the metrics, um, oh, I just want to pause for a question. Blake asks, um, how will providers be chosen to participate in these projects, which is a great question. Um, no one has been selected at this point. That will all happen through our collaboratives, um, which we'll be pulling together later in November to really discuss implementation plans for these projects. That's where we're going to start to bring partners together at the table and figure out who's the best um, the best fit for each project. Those decisions will be heavily based off of um, a lot of the initial feedback we've gotten so far through the health systems inventories, through our letters of interest. Um, but there will be collaborative tables forming later this fall, early winter, where we'll start to actually plan out um, who's going to participate in which projects. Great question. And we'll be talking a little bit more about the collaboratives at the end if there's some more questions on those. Um, another question, is BHT still accepting LOIs? Uh, technically, no, our LOI process is closed, um, but I'll also add that if there was anywhere that you're interested in projects that it didn't get captured in the LOI, we are happy to have a follow-up conversation or, um, you know, our staff is just available. We're happy to hear where it is you're interested in projects. We want as much information as we can. Um, so if you didn't get to submit an LOI, but you want you want us to know what you're interested in, um, feel free to reach out to me and we can, we can talk about some next steps on that. All right, so 
On the left side, we've got eight projects at 100% funded. Um, our maximum earning potential is $56.92 million, so we're going to estimate that at about $57 million. Now, if we only selected six projects, um, the difference isn't actually, it's not that huge. So if we, we, we took out, in this case, we looked at taking out maternal and child health and oral health. Um, this is because these, those two projects have, we'll be discussing this a little bit later because I want all of your feedback on this, but our initial thinking was that those are the um, lowest weighted project areas, so they've received the least amount of funding opportunity. And also, um, when looking at the metrics, we have, we have a little bit of nervousness about whether or not the models that are in the toolkit can actually earn on all of the outcomes that are listed for our region. But I'm going to hold that thought because we're going to, I, I want to discuss that more with you all a little bit later. Uh, but just for the sake of financial modeling, you can see that the difference between eight projects and six projects, um, it isn't huge. It's less than a million dollars if we, if we um, do all of our projects with 100% success. Now, here's the difference with four projects. Um, I'm going to go ahead and say that when we had the $89 million, all of BHT's conversations were really about, is it six projects or is it eight projects? Um, once we heard about the funding cuts, we thought, you know, maybe that means we're going to need to focus a little bit more on just four projects. Um, again, this is something that we want to discuss. So we went ahead and ran the number for four projects too. Um, at the left, you see eight projects with 100% uh, success. Now on the right, if we only choose four projects and we um, succeed at 100%, we are only at about $53 million. So that's about $3.77 million, $3 million that we would leave on the table and be unable to earn. Um, now, yeah, so that's, you know, that's sort of the, the downside. And what I sh also will point out is that because we, you'll see here that if you forego these projects in the four project area, the numbers that are actually what you can earn on in years three, four, and five increase for the projects we selected. So because we chose to give up four projects here, we actually can earn um, in year five nearly $2 million more for bidirectional integration. So later in the project, the dollars you forego gets rebased into the project's areas that you accept, but it's not to the full amount. So you can never get the full potential that you would have if you had selected all eight projects. All right, so then we took a look at 75% performance. So let's say that across the board, we were about a C, C average. If we do eight projects, um, that looks at 55, almost $56 million. So that's about a million dollar difference um, if, we don't, if we don't succeed, if, we don't, if we're not a top performer in all those categories. Now, meanwhile, this is where it gets more interesting. If, um, oh, I'm sorry, I, I said that wrong. This is if we only perform poorly in oral health and maternal and child health. So let's say, let's take the risk. We decide we'll do all eight projects, um, you know, and maybe there's a chance that we're not really gonna hit the mark on opioid, I mean, on maternal and child health and oral health services. But you know what? We're still at, we're still at, um, we, we really just missed out on about a million dollars because we had poor, poor performance in those areas. So that would be an, you know, a question of weighing, is that loss worth it? Is that an acceptable risk for our region? Uh, and then we looked at six projects to see, well, what if we took those off? And because we took them off, we were a top performer and we, you know, we excelled everywhere else. Then we end up actually with more money than if we had tried and failed. And here's sort of the same the same scenario for four. So if we did eight projects, but we actually struggled in four areas, so we had 75% performance on 
four project areas. And for this, we looked at um, including transitional care and diversion in the projects that we did poorly on. Then we actually see a pretty big loss. Um, we're down to 52 million or 50, excuse me, more like 53 million for our maximum earning potential. Um, but same, if we, if we choose to not do four, or not do four projects, only accept four projects as a whole and do really, really well on those projects that we do accept, then we have the potential to earn 53 million, which is a little bit more than what we would have, would have earned on eight with poor, poor performance. So overall, um, one takeaway is it does feel like the, the best option is to be a top performer and to try to figure out which of these we can be, we feel confident that we can be a top performer on and where we're questioning our performance, um, is that risk worth the potential loss? So that's kind of the, the framing of the conversation I am hoping to have today. Um, this is sort of a quick summary of the different amounts that we just talked about. So you'll see here, if based off the number of projects, this is the amount we could earn. If we get 100%, we're a top performer, we succeed everywhere. Um, this is if we do eight projects and we succeed poorly in two of them, we get slightly less. Like I said, it's just about a million less dollars. And here, if we do poorly in four project areas, we see it's down to 53 million. So that was a lot of numbers. And I could recognize that for some, it might be hard to follow over a webinar. So I want to pause again and see if anyone has any questions or if anyone wanted me to go back so you could look at any of those slides a little more. All right, so hearing none, I'm going to keep moving on. Um, this slide just shows some of the criteria that we have used um, in our discussions so far about looking at projects. Um, we, as you probably know, intended to have this conversation with the Leadership Council um, two weeks ago, and but that was when we heard the announcement of the funding cuts, and all of my slides were done for $89 million and we needed some time to redo them all based on the funding cuts, so that, that's why we switched it to today. Um, since then, we have had a meeting of our waiver finance team where they discussed six versus eight, and this is the criteria that they used um, when looking at, uh, looking at that decision. So first of all, we're looking at health equity. It's really um, sort of asking what's the impact of this project, and does it really stand to reduce disparities? Um, Feasibility of data and measurement. Can we actually get the data? Um, is this something that we can feasibly measure? Because we're going to be, all of our earning will be based off of our ability to report our improvement. Um, we need to know that we actually have the data infrastructure and capabilities to accomplish that. Um, legal feasibility, just, you know, is this project controversial? Are there any policy concerns related to, um, to, adopting this project, and then social feasibility, um, sort of how multi-sector sector is this project. Um, we need to look at any unintended con consequences for other sectors or other partners in the project. Um, and also, you know, the community engagement, and is this really true? Is, it, is, it, uh, is the project true to our community needs and priorities? And then we also looked at practicality. So that's, you know, really hoping that projects are building off of existing momentum. Um, and also that there's a sustainability plan. So this is a project that will last um, after demonstration dollars have run out. And then finally looking at the earning potential. So is there really potential to earn, earn on these dollars? All right, so my plan, um, I see we've got a question from Dave Iverson asking if, um, the measurements are going to be more difficult each year, like if they get successively harder um, between three and five years. And um, great timing on that question, because I'm going to walk through some of the metrics right now and um, 
sort of the differences in the in the reporting year to year. Um, so, like I said, our I'd originally planned to host this webinar just on six versus eight, and the question of do we do six projects or do we do eight projects? BHT thinking on this has been that. Um, First of all, all of the projects in care delivery redesign, so that's bi-directional integration of care, transition, diversions, and community care coordination, those really feel to us like necessary pieces, foundational pieces in our vision of a transformed system. Because that's talking about, you know, um, that's really the, the meat of where we're seeing clients transitioning and navigating the care that they need and trying to get those transitions and connections really solid so that we have more efficient flow and how, um, how folks are accessing and navigating the system. So it, the, all those projects intersect so well together. And you know when we looked at the metrics, the difference between four projects and six projects, there was actually only one metric um, there's only a one metric difference because so many of those projects rely on the same metrics. Um, meaning that if we earning it in one area, we can earn on that metric for all of the project areas and it has a higher potential for us to succeed. So six projects has always made sense for us because um, two projects are required, three projects feel necessary for our success, and then chronic disease and management is an issue that's so big and so expensive, it seems like it would be pretty much would be a huge miss for us in actually attaining our, our outcomes if we didn't look at, at um, issues relating to diabetes, hypertension, and asthma. So this has kind of left us with maternal and child health and oral health and this, okay, what do we do? We really have to figure out the feasibility of these projects because it certainly doesn't feel good to me to say that maternal and child health and oral health are the projects that we're thinking about taking off the table because first of all oral health access has been one of BHT's leading community priorities since the beginning so this is something that's really important to us and we understand just the huge amount of access barriers there are in our region and also just for the simple fact of like who can say no to moms and babies. And also this is probably the project that has the maternal and child health is probably the project that has the highest potential for um, really looking at prevention because of the focus on, you know, pregnant moms and home visiting with young kiddos. Um, however, in that same sense, it may not track to a high level of improvement in the five year demonstration period because a lot of those changes aren't going to be realized until, you know, well after in a young, young kiddo's life. So my intent now is to sort of walk through what we know about maternal and child health and oral health projects and kind of show you all where our thinking is and then open it up for discussion and feedback because I would love to hear from leadership council members just sort of how this feels and, you know, what seems like the best, the best approach to all of you. All right. So looking at maternal and child health, um, this project is weighted at 5%. Uh, it's the max amount of funding. And this is this was pre-cuts. So I don't have a post-cut number. I apologize. You could estimate that it would be 30% less than this. Um, but 30% less than $5.4 million. Um, this project includes approaches um, for home visiting. So there's a number of evidence-based home visiting models, including nurse family partnership, um, parents as teachers, bright futures, um, as well as the CDC's 10 recommendations to improve preconception health. That really looks at getting folks connected to long acting reversible contraceptive. And um, for us, we see an intersection with one key question where um, folks are asking, you know, when you go in for a primary care visit, they're saying, you know, do you do you want to have a baby in the next year? And if someone says no, you say, okay, well, let's talk about birth control. And if someone says yes, then we say, okay, let's talk about intentional parenting. Um, so here is a timeline of the models or the metrics that we would have to earn on and report on through the five years. 
Um, so it starts out with just, you know, how many people have we trained? Um, how many providers are prepared to, you know, implement this model? That's sort of our, our last pay for reporting, um, that 25% pay for milestones that happens in year three. But then once we're moving through um, years three and five, we increase the number of metrics that we're earning on. So here, starting in year three, we would start to report out on chlamydia screening, mental health treatment penetration, emergency department visits, substance use treatment, and well child visits. So between years three and five, we would need to be reporting and showing improvements on these metrics. Then starting in year four, so Dave, this speaks to your question. Um, year four, we add on some more metrics. So in that sense, it does get more challenging because um, we, we have to be working our way up to preparing to add more metrics onto this project. Um, so by year four, we would need to be showing improvement in immunization status, uh, contraceptive care for a variety of methods, and uh, then looking at well-child visits and prenatal care in the first trimester. Uh, so these are the metrics that we would be asked to earn on. This is a quick overview of the models that are called out in the toolkit for um, attaining those metrics. And BHT, if we select maternal and child health, would then be working with partners to figure out which of these models is the best fit for our region to take on. Um, I can say right now, from just my current state assessment, uh, based off of the health systems inventory, we heard that actually a lot of folks, um, a lot of clinics are either already implementing Bright Futures or are implementing a um, something that's loosely based off of Bright Futures that could probably easily be adapted into the full Bright Futures model. Um, we also know there's a robust nurse family partnership program within all three of our area's health districts. Um, however, I've also heard that nurse family partnership is really expensive and that's been a concern in, in conversations that practice that's um, because these, these dollars can't really, they can't be used to pay for service that that might not be a viable model. Um, I'm not the expert, just sharing what I've heard. Um, and here is a quick little slide of how we're doing on those models. So for maternal and child health, um, there's a lot of places where we're exceeding the average. We're doing pretty great on most moderately effective contraception. I actually happen to know that we're the best uh, region in the state on that metric. So way to go, BHT. Um, we're also the worst in the region. I mean, worst in the state when it comes to childhood immunization status. 8% is the, the lowest ranked, we're the lowest ranked BHT or lowest ranked region for immunization status. So when considering whether or not maternal and child health is a viable project, we would need to think about um, if we can reasonably within five years close these gaps or show significant improvement in um, these different model areas. And apologies, we don't have uh, we don't have data for well child visits, um, so that one's blank. All right, and here is a quick summary of some of the LOIs that we received that showed interest in maternal and child health projects. These are just the folks who said they were interested in um, sort of owning a project. So the uh, public health districts were all interested in nurse family partnerships, Northeast tries, doing bright futures. Um, and then we had a lot of folks who were interested in projects um, related to LARC. So not, not shown here, oops, sorry, shown on this slide. Um, almost all of the clinics in our region are either already offering long acting reversible contraceptive um, or one, are asking one key question. So it seems like a pretty, uh, we're, we're ready to be trying to get folks access to LARC, but I'm not clear yet on why it is that we have such a low rate um, compared to the state average. So I think that we need to do some digging on sort of what's been the big barrier there. Um, but with that, this is the information that I have about maternal and child health, and I'm happy to answer other questions or, um, you know, flip through these slides as needed. But I would love to hear some feedback from all of you on, you know, what are your thoughts when looking at these, these metrics? Um, 
do does it seem like this is a a viable, feasible project for BHT? Do you think in five years we can show measurable improvement on these model these measures listed here? Um, essentially through changing practices within a clinic, like working to better connect folks to their to getting um, contraceptive or through care coordination. Um, or through home visiting, where folks are, you know, actually implementing a home visiting model and going out into homes and conducting well child visit or, um, you know, immun immunization screening and, and so forth. So that's sort of a quick summary of how the models would look and the metrics. And I'd like to just pause and open it up for any reflections or thoughts that folks in the room have. Hi, Hadley. This is Sarah from Netted. I just have a quick question as far as when we're looking at all these metrics, be um, do we have any idea how the state is going to weight them? Are they going, all going to be weighted evenly? Um, do we have any idea from HCA what that's going to look like? Um, I do not have an understanding of that yet. I have heard that they, that sometime, well, the healthcare authority said in September they were going to be releasing, um, what the improvement measurements would be sort of, and what the gap to goal targets would be. And so since we didn't get those in September, that probably means that at any time, sometime in October, they may be coming. <laughs> um, and I'm hoping that that might bring some clarity. But at this exact moment in time, I don't I don't fully understand how the different metrics will be weighted or exactly how the earning, how the, the dollars are tied to the metrics. So uh, we just got another great question. Um, for metrics where we're outperforming other areas of the state, it seems unlikely that we'd have much room to improve. Very true. Um, as long as we're above the metric standard, is that enough? Or do we still need to show improvement? Um, so that could go either way. It depends on if, if the metric that we're discussing is an improvement over self metric or a gap to goal metric. So if it's an improvement over self, and we're already doing really well. You're right. It might be a, it might be hard to make any more improvement um, if we're already succeeding. If we've already done a lot of work there. Now, if it's a gap to goal, um, it might mean we have less work to do because if we're above the state average, we're likely closer to meeting that gap. Um, and if we were above, if the gap had already been filled, if the healthcare authority says, you know, you need to get up to the state average on, let's take an example you need to get up to the state average on contraception most moderately effective, then we've already done it. We nailed it. We're good. Um, but right now I don't have an understanding of which, um, which of the metrics are going to be, which improve, what, uh, how we're going to be measured on which metrics. There we go. A joy of this building the airplane while we're falling out of it. Does anyone have any thoughts about sort of the feasibility of maternal and child health or just gut reactions to hearing that we're thinking about not doing maternal and child health? So I'm getting some great, great commentary in the chat box. Thanks for the brave folks who are giving commentary. I think, um, yeah, this is this is a huge struggle. Um, someone says, I think I'm struggling with what everyone is struggling with. The project is important, and I think we can move the needle, but we have to step up on the balcony as well and look at how we can earn the most for our region. That's very well put because that's exactly the position we're in. Um, you know, something that I'm thinking of a lot is through – demonstration, we're going to be asking, you know, providers and folks on the ground to be making a lot of changes in the day-to-day -day work that they do. And 
just sort of what's the capacity of our providers. I mean, um, the bidirectional integration project and care coordination projects um, are definitely going to require a level of of change management within practices to, you know, potentially uh, change how primary care visits go. There might be new staffing, there's new training. Like there's a lot that's being asked of partners right now. Um, so something that I'm really worried about is just capacity in, is the difference between six and eight projects actually going to free up providers to do, um, to be able to be more focused and really succeed on the projects that we select? Or is maternal and child health and oral health, like, are, is doing all eight, is there already so much work to do that adding two more isn't super terrifying? Um, that's sort of another thing that I'm, that I'm wrestling with and would love some feedback on. Someone asks if there's infrastructure in place that could impact those low metrics, um, like an immunization, for example. And that's a great question. That's, and I don't, I would love to open that question up to the group if anyone has ideas. Like, do you, are there serious infrastructure barriers that are preventing us from seeing improvement in some of these areas? And yeah, so, you know, um, someone brings up a great point that there's a lot of opportunity for the Medicaid maternal and child health population to benefit from projects. Um, so we look at care coordination, for example, uh, access to contraceptive. So LARC is actually a pathways within the pathways model. So we could say, uh, you know, I want it to be really, really clear that by not choosing maternal and child health or by not choosing oral health, in no way are we saying like our ACH is not going to focus on those populations or they don't matter to us. They're still part of the system and there's still multiple ways that they can be impacted through other projects. And we're looking at, is it a better use of our time to focus our energy on how we can improve lives for these populations within other project areas rather than spread ourselves too thin over eight projects. So in this example, um, I think about, well, with, uh, with pathways, we could increase, we could definitely see some increase in uh, contraceptive through pathways. If we develop regular care coordination pathways where folks are getting screened for, um, you know, screened for whether or not they have contraception, want to have kids in the future, and, you know, get a pipeline for making that happen. Um, we also know that pathways can impact childhood immunization status because there, you know, there's an assessment where it would be flagged if a child didn't have the, you know, their right immunizations. So we still have, we still have high potential to impact these metrics and to um, support this population. But if we don't, if we don't ex if we don't um, choose this project, then we don't. While we don't earn on the metrics, so we don't have the opportunity to earn on the metrics here, um, we also lose the risk. Like we don't have the risk of not earning because we failed somewhere. While we can still, in other areas, um, based off of what is a community commitment, not you know not a commitment to the healthcare authority in these projects, but we we could set community priorities that say you know, pathways is going to, we're going to have a maternal and child health pathways that's focused on, you know, getting folks contraceptive or getting folks their well-child visits. So there are other places that we can be flexible in saying, you know, maybe this project isn't the right fit, but we're going to prioritize this population in a different way. Yeah, so somebody asks if we have a, a slide about how many metrics we would reduce between four and six projects. 
Um, and then uh, the difference between four and six and eight. So the difference between four projects and six projects is only one metric. And when I heard that, I was, I mean, my gut reaction was like, well, then I think it should be six because we already would be doing the work for pretty much all of those metrics, um, except for one. Uh, and that's because in transition, diversion, care coordination, uh, opioids, and uh, bidirectional integration of care, all of those have very, very similar metrics that are looking at ED use, um, follow-up after discharge. There are a lot of access and penetration-related metrics. Um, so they're very well aligned in those sense. Oral health, maternal and child health, and opioids are the three projects that have the most distinct um, uh, distinct metrics that are not tied to other project areas. So the difference between six projects and eight projects is much more significant in the metrics. Um, unfortunately, I don't have that number off the top of my head, but there are considerably more metrics that would be standalone because for example, um, chlamydia screening, all of these ones related to contraceptive, and I believe, Oh, prenatal care and first trimester, those are all only related to maternal and child health. So we could only have one potential to earn to draw on funds for these. We would not be impacting them through other project areas. That's the same for oral health, um, which is another reason why eight projects feels like a slightly bigger risk because it greatly increases the number of metrics or it increases the spread of metrics that we would be earning towards. And I appreciate some really helpful commentary that it is so difficult to really look at these projects in a silo. Um, so just to call out maternal and child health on its own is difficult because it is impacted in all those other project areas. Um, and really, you know, it's been our goal from all along not to have this be a, um, not to look at any of the projects as standalones, but have them all be, how can, how are all of these projects intersecting what's the shared infrastructure for all of these um, different initiatives. And so, yeah, it is really hard to parse them out. Um, I think the fact that the metrics are so different is what makes it slightly easier for me in my mind to hold maternal and child health and oral health differently. Okay, I'm gonna do one more pause to see if there are any other thoughts or reflections on maternal and child health in general before we sort of move through through the um, oral health data. Okay, moving on. All right, so looking at oral health. Um, so the oral health project weight is at 3%. Um, and our estimated max funding before the cuts was 2.7 million for that project. Um, so this is definitely a, a smaller project area as far as the funding goes. Now the approaches that are listed um, are include oral health and primary care. So that's um, applying a fluoride varnish in a primary care setting and also doing um, oral health screening and assessment in primary care. Um, and then the other model is the mobile portable dental care. Um, so here's another, another way to look at that. Um, when we look at the mobile portal dental care, there are a lot of sort of different options for how that looks. Um, in our region, we have some folks who are doing mobile dentistry based off, you know, they sort of just have a moving shop and they can, they're popping up in schools or clinics or, um, you know, social determinants organizations. Um, we have some rural places where, you know, providers have a clinic where they um, open up their doors one day a week for a dentist to come in and see patients. Um, and there's also some potential opportunities for like tele-dentistry um, within this project. And then the oral health and primary care is really focused more on the primary care clinic side than it is within the oral health care delivery system. 
All right, here we got our metrics for oral health. Um, not as many, but still pretty mighty. Um, so again, we start out with those early, the last bit of our paper reporting is just about the number of partners that we have, number of Medicaid beneficiaries served, um, and the number of folks who have been trained on new evidence-based approaches uh, to meet the needs for demonstration. So starting in year three, we will begin to report on emergency department visits. So again, that's that's going to be our one that's pretty much in every single project area because that's where we see so much uh, so much cost is in avoidable ER use. Um, and then we'll be looking at uh, primary care caries as part of a well child visit. Um, so that's also looking in the primary care setting. That's looking at our doctors doing, or I mean, or providers in primary care um, screening children for dental issues when they come in for their well child visits. Um, and then just the overall utilization of dental services by Medicaid beneficiaries. Moving into year four, we would add measurements for dental sealants for children um, who are at elevated risk of cavities. Um, the rate of ongoing care for adults and the um, rate of evaluations for adults. So those would be our metrics. Here is a quick snapshot of how we're doing. Unfortunately, I don't have um, data for these ongoing care and evaluations for adults with chronic periodontis. Is that tooth decay? Can one of my teeth people help me out there? <laughs> I see tooth people on this call. Hi, hi, Maureen. Can you hear me, Hadley? Yeah. <laughs> okay, so the periodontitis is not tooth decay. It's actually um, periodont. It's gum disease. Oh, right. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Yep, you're welcome. <laughs> I was like, it's one of those two. Okay, gum disease. And can you answer one more question for me? Um, is gum disease traditionally treated in the dentist office or in a doctor's office? In the dentist's office, okay. um, and also independent hygienists can do root scaling and planing. So the kind of mobile care you were talking about, mm -hmm. that can actually get addressed in the field as well. It doesn't have to be done in a dentist's office. Good to know. Thank you, Maureen. Great. So again, here's our sort of our baselines on how we're looking. Um, when you see a arrow pointing down, that means that oops, arrow pointing down means a low rate is better. So because we're past the state average here, we're actually that's actually a bad thing. Um, we are we are worse than the state average for ED visits. Um, we have a pretty we have a kind of a big gap on dental sealants for children um, in both age categories. And we're doing about average and a little above average for overall utilization of dental services. Um, what we know from our optional LOI is there is certainly interest in oral health projects. Um, the application of sealants is already happening in some folks, uh, in some areas. Uh, Spokane, I know, has um, some school sealant programs. There was interest in teledentistry uh, in our. LOI process and also some of that sort of pop-up uh, dental chair within uh, other service networks. Um, and then when our with our health systems inventory, we found that there are a lot of folks, a lot of clinics who are ready and willing to add fluoride varnish and um, quick dental screening into their primary care visits. However, the main concern is that um, a lot of practices have 15-minute time limits in their primary care visits, and adding on another question is um, there's, there's fear that there's not time to add on another procedure and another question in those, in those settings. Um, so that's still up for discussion, but we have a lot of interested partners. Um, Providence you know, is bringing this new dental residency clinic online, which is definitely going to stand to increase access for uh, folks needing oral health care in our region. Um, that is not in any way, I think, 
something that's really fundable by the waiver or related to the waiver projects. But it's exciting to know that at the same time as this is happening, there is some um, big movement to increase our access in our region. Oh, that's the end of my slide, so. We had no, um, like I said, while there is, we have some folks doing the more of a pop-up style uh, mobile dental. Um, we didn't have any interest in, say, like starting, launching a mobile bus or um, like a an all-out mobile dental unit. Um, so that's my overview of oral health. Um, I will leave us here. That's probably the easiest slide. Um, so for us, here are sort of the, uh, this is what, this is where we're struggling. Um, a big thing that's holding us up is that none of these, the models here and the metrics here, um, aren't really speaking to one of the biggest issues for oral health access, which is, um, there are really not enough seats for folks on Medicaid. There's huge wait lists, very long wait lists for folks on Medicaid looking for dental care, um, largely because the reimbursement rate for Medicaid dental is so poor that it's just not worth, um, we're hearing it's really not worth, oh, you can't see my slides. Thanks for telling me that. <laughs> there we go. Um, so we've heard that um, without, without policy change, it's going to address the reimbursement issue. It's going to be really, really hard to motivate providers to get more, uh, to take more Medicaid patients. Now, my, our worry then is that knowing that, do these metrics have, um, or do these models have the potential to really significantly increase access, um, and keep folks from using the ER, um, you know, the way that they stand now. So that's something that I'm, I'm really interested in having a conversation about. Um, and I'm just, you know, maybe I'll start with just opening it up for any reactions to this and, you know, we can talk through it more. Uh, the other thing that's, that's sort of tripping me up on this one is um, how much of the work is being, is focused around the primary care setting. So, you know, the applying fluoride varnish and doing screenings in primary care is a big part of this project area. And do we have the potential to sort of incentivize that as a community priority instead of as a project? So say um, applying fluoride varnish or, you know, doing that screening in primary care, is that something that we could prioritize in our systems redesign? and then try to see how pathways can help better link or how we can use care coordination to make sure that when someone is flagged in primary care for a dental issue, that they're connected to a dentist. Um, that doesn't solve our reimbursement issue either, but, you know, so we're, we've, you know, we're trying to think what are some of the other creative solutions here? Um, or is the, are, is this project, viable. It's something that people are excited about. So I would love to pause and open it up for any reactions or thoughts. This is Maureen from the Arcora Foundation, and um, I, I was waiting to hear if anyone else would weigh in before. Um, this is sort of this is what the Arcora Foundation focuses on. So um, we used to be called the Washington Dental Service Foundation. So for those of you on the phone, you might know us by that name. But we're working across the state with um, all nine of the ACHs on this. Um, on the projects and this is a real sort of all the questions that you posed Hadley are questions that the other areas are also kind of struggling with. Um, what I will say is I would encourage us to not get so hung up on what the recommended um, solutions are within the toolkit because I think as you put Hadley there's no way that we could um, get to some of these metrics if we solely focus on those projects. Um, so I would kind of think of it as a both and strategy that those are some of the ways we might hit the metrics, but 
There are a whole host of other um, interventions that, um, that will help with this. The other thing I will say is that um, because oral health is only 3% of the entire um, bucket, you, it's just a lot less risky, right? Like while there's, um, there's not at much, there's not as much at stake here. Um, so those are just kind of two observations. I think um, the other thing I want to highlight for the group is that there is legislation that was passed this year that's going to increase reimbursement for dentists to see pregnant women and patients with diabetes. Um, and I think that's really important as it relates to the ACH because that those populations touch a lot of the other project areas. Um, and so there will be built-in incentive for dentists to um, see those populations, and it's specifically around um, periodontal treatment. So um, that will likely start in 2019. Um, the other thing I want to highlight is a, a tool that the foundation has been piloting that will be rolling out statewide called Dentist Link, and essentially it's an automated referral system. So what we're doing is we're building a provider network on the back end and um, similar to other sort of automated systems, the patient logs in, um, set, puts in some sort of identifying information and um, the hope is that that person then gets connected immediately to a dentist that will see them. And because um, as we all know that the access challenges are huge. And so that is something that we're um, working on and um, the other thing I should backing up talking about oral health connections, the enhanced reimbursement, it's only it's being piloted in three uh, counties and Spokane is one of those counties. So um, I think there's huge opportunity here. I think the other thing I'll say about the metrics is um, when you look at them, you know, we're actually the gap to goal is zero pretty much on almost all the metrics with the exception of the sealants, mm -hmm. um, which I think that is not a that's not a hard one to to meet. Um, so um, the periodontist the the and then of course we don't have good data around the the chronic periodontitis, but um, I think we certainly can get there. I think the the other comment I'll make and then I'll stop is um, I think what's really sort of a missed opportunity here is that these sort of oral health strategies aren't gonna get us to a transformed system, right? Like these are really just getting at utilization and access. Um, but we know in order to really transform the system, we have to be working upstream at prevention. And that's where the primary care intervention comes in. Um, but I think there's a need to kind of do multiple strategies simultaneously um, that focus on prevention access and then eventually transformation. Um, and then I put this in the chat box, but I think there's also opportunities to consider um, specifically around oral health. That's the one I'm the most familiar with, but I would guess around some of the other optional projects that could go into domain one and domain two. So, um, yeah, and then I, and then the last thing is that um, the foundation is working on sort of a place-based effort in Spokane that touches on a lot of these various strategies, and um, I'm pretty confident that there won't be challenges around hitting the metrics given the infusion of resources and funding and um, bringing partners together. So I guess I'd I'd encourage the um, the partners at the table to think about this as kind of uh, an integrated strategy approach. And given the huge need for oral health services in Spokane and the surrounding areas, that um, it's a missed opportunity to really focus on transforming um, specifically the access piece of it. Well said, Maureen. Thanks for all those, all those comments. Um, I've been getting some questions in that um, I would love some, some feedback on. So some folks have asked, um, will primary care providers be able to get reimbursed for screening and varnish? Because if there's an added cost on top of the already low Medicaid rates, um, I would expect that, I wouldn't expect much interest. Very good point. 
Um, it seems that many practices being evaluated take place at primary care visits, not at dental offices. So that's a big shift for um, those who are providing primary care. Um, and again, that might make it harder for providers to get behind. And we've got a third chiming in um, over from Newport Hospital who's saying, yeah, that, that could be really difficult for already packed uh, providers. And so I wonder if there's if anyone else has comments on that or if there's anyone who maybe could speak as a provider or um, Maureen, I don't know if you guys have talked to primary care providers at all, but what what's the what's the feeling for primary care providers on, you know, adding this in as a service? I don't have an answer to the um, reimbursement question. I'm not sure if they could be reimbursed for screening and varnish, but I'm going to look into that. Yeah, so it is a reimbursable service. Okay. Um, you get reimbursed for education, screening, and fluoride varnish. So it's actually three codes. And um, it's one of the only USPSTF, so the United, um, Services Preventive Task Force um, grade B recommendations for well child visits is fluoride varnish. Uh, there's only one other grade B recommendation. So when you look at all the things that have to get done in a well child visit, um, fluoride varnish is actually one of the only ones that the Preventive Services Task Force has said you absolutely must and should be doing this. Um, and the the reason being that the um, the research around the ability for fluoride varnish to prevent and arrest cavities is uh, it's really good. And so um, because of the consistent interaction that primary care providers have with families, um, it's a, they're a great partner to have in um, doing that. And then to address the piece around how it fits into the visit, um, this is a big deal, right? Providers are being asked to do more and more and more. And so um, what, what the foundation does is actually help providers figure out how it fits into the overall workflow. Um, of a practice. So um, often it's not actually the provider that's applying the varnish. It's often the medical assistant or a nurse. And um, it actually doesn't take more than like 15 to 30 seconds within the visit. Um, and then the other piece just that I'll put out there to think about is that um, because it is a reimbursable service, um, this looks a little different when you're in an FQHC setting because there's an encounter versus um, the billable procedures. And so um, that's where I think there we've, we have had some uptick in the integration piece, but um, I will just be really honest that that's been a system that's been more challenging to engage with um, because there isn't the financial incentive there to do it. Got it. Any of the folks who are making comments um, about that concern have have a response or updated thinking? So another issue that I want to I want to comment on. Um, this point was brought up by Dave Iverson up in Ferry County. Um, screening and referral sounds like a good idea, but if there's no dental care provider to refer to, then it makes the PCP a moot point in our area. The reimbursement chases away providers. So with oral health specifically, I think this is one of the projects where we see the biggest disparity between Spokane and our rural, uh, rural counties, because Spokane just has so much more access. Um, there's, I mean, there's just way more providers, especially with the, you know, with the um, dental residency program coming in, we're going to even see more access, but that's not necessarily necessarily translating to access for rural folks. And um, we've definitely heard that all throughout all of the rural areas, they have a much harder time um, attracting dentists who want to stay because there's, first of all, high rates of Medicaid um, and not everyone wants to live out there. I don't know why. I love it out there. but <laughs> So we've really heard that um, challenge. And I think when thinking about oral health, now if we, um, when we select oral health, we would be committing the whole region to this. So it's not, we can't just do it county by county. It's the whole region. Now, that being said, there's still the possibility that population-wise, we could focus all efforts on Spokane and hit the mark. Um, 
just because that's where, you know, that's where the bulk of our population for our region is. Um, but that doesn't really feel like systemic transformation to me. So one of the, one of the challenges is trying to figure out how these models apply to the rural versus urban population, or, or urban versus rural populations. Um, and sort of how equitable that fit is there. Um, and I'm wondering if anyone has thoughts or comments on that. Y'all thought this was just going to be one of those sit back on Friday and listen in webinars, but here I am asking you to talk. Alrighty, folks, you're making it hard for me. <laughs> um, so this is, you know, this is our thinking so far. What I will share is that we, um, we took this to the waiver finance team, who's really looking at um, sort of figuring out how, um, how we want to allocate our the waiver dollars as we earn them. Um, they, they looked at this on Monday, and they took a vote of six, four versus six versus eight. Uh, zero people voted for four. That went off the table pretty pretty quickly once we realized that that issue of there only being a one metric difference. Um, and with six versus eight, it was an even split in the room. So it was half people voted for six and half people voted for eight. Um, so pretty much we're still totally torn. <laughs> Um, so at this point, I would just love, um, you know, I just want to open it up. And if anyone has any just general thoughts or reflections or gut reactions to six versus eight, I would love to hear them. Um, I'm just capturing all of these comments and questions that we received to try to, you know, help inform our thinking on this. Um, and I'll be bringing any insight that we get from here back to the waiver finance team and back to the board so that they know sort of some of the thinking that we've heard. Um, but I would love it if there's anyone out there who has, has thoughts on their gut reaction to uh, BHT chooses six projects and leaves out oral health and maternal and child health or BHT takes on all projects. What sounds good? And I'll add one other comment too, which is that it could be seven. <laughs> We've really been framing this as a six versus eight because a lot of the the issues for oral health and maternal and child health were were so similar. We're like, ah, we don't know if we can meet all of those metrics. Um, we don't know if it touches the real issue, and we think that we can we can prioritize those populations and metrics in other areas of the waiver. So we've kind of been grouping them together in that sense, also because they're they're both weighted so lowly. But um, we would be happy to also entertain seven projects. We got one comment that after today's presentation, I'd lean more towards six, but I wouldn't say that BHT is leaving out oral and maternal child health. I think that's a really good point of clarification and probably a good, um, good critique of how I've been communicating this. So thanks, Amber, because you're right. We, we really do not want it to seem like we're leaving out or like ignoring those areas we are still very committed to improving health um, and oral health, maternal and child health is very much a big part of that. So I think we need to update our language to make sure that it's clear that we would still be prioritizing those um, populations, but we would be looking for other ways to do it. We got another comment that six, um, these projects are gonna be a lot of work and we can focus on fewer um, we can be more focused while still including the that population. We got another, I think we should take on six and try to address those through other areas in the waiver. 
Um, some of those metrics will be addressed through other projects. Very true. I've got three for six. Any other any other thoughts or reflections? Someone says, I'm less concerned about the value of the projects than I am about capacity or ability to deliver while maintaining a broad distribution of resources throughout the region. Therefore, six. I hear you. Alrighty, I'm thinking I'm thinking we're kind of wrapping up. So I'm gonna give I'm gonna sit here for one more minute of awkward silence in case anyone else is typing. Alrighty, folks. And with that, I first of all just want to say thank you for being here, participating on a Friday morning. And um, your comments are really, really helpful for me in how we continue to frame this discussion. And I'll be uh, putting out a record of all the chat comments. And we've been taking notes, so I'll make sure all of the thoughts that have been presented today are um, brought to the rest of the BHT team and the BHT board as well. Um, we do not really have a timeline on next steps for when we're making this decision. I think it's going to go to the board uh, at our next board meeting. Um, so I'll be keeping updates in all of the um, weekly ACH happenings that I hope you're all getting every Monday on where this decision is going. And if folks have any other comments or concerns, um, anything that they want to elevate to BHT, please know at any point in time, you can always email or call me. I'm Hadley, H-A-D-L-E-Y, at betterhealthtogether.org. Um, and then my final announcement is we, um, this session has been part of a series that we're hosting every Friday um, with a different focus each week on either some sort of informational session where we're learning about a strategy or initiative related to the projects, um, or it'll be more like this, where we're kind of focusing on a group discussion, sort of feedback session on various decisions being made. Uh, next week, we are going to be welcoming um, someone, a guest pre presentation to talk about value-based payments and give an update on the work of the value-based payment task force and um, how that work is moving forward. Um, the, I just want to make one announcement that based on um, some scheduling challenges with the presenter, we have moved the time of that one. So that's going to start at 11 um, instead of 10 a.m. So I'll be sending out um, an announcement with the recap of this. Just reminds everyone we're going to push that back an hour. But so next week's session will be from 11 to 1. And I imagine much like this one, it's not going to take the full two hours. Um, we're going to leave it open in case in case the discussion grows. But um It'll probably be about an hour and a half. Um, and yeah, I think that's all I've got for you today. So um, thanks all for joining and for being brave and sharing some feedback with us. I hope this was helpful. Um, I always appreciate any comments after the fact on whether or not this was useful, um, if it was presented clearly. So um, I'm just going to go ahead and stay stay on the line in case there's anyone who wouldn't mind leaving me a chat or two about um, whether or not this was a good use of your time and the information was clear. And other than that, I'm going to say have a wonderful rest of your Friday. And I hope you all have great cozy weekend plans. And we will get back to work changing the world on Monday. Bye, all.